All right, let's go ahead and get started. If you can have your seats, please. This is going to be one of the most exciting and useful panels of the day. <laughs> All right, this next panel, these are the people that, that are uh, basically in the, in the trenches with you guys doing, doing this work. Uh, they've all started up their own practices. Uh, so they've, they've done this themselves. They're, they're, they know exactly uh, what's involved in setting up the practices. You know, one of the things that, you know, what, if you've never run a business or set up a practice, there are so many things that you've just never even contemplated. Uh, and it really can be seeming like drinking from a fire hose. So, you know, you're, you've never set up or dealt with OSHA. You've never dealt with CLIA. You've never had to, you know, determine what bank accounts and setting up a website and how do you hire people. I mean, all these, these things that you just never thought of as, as a physician if you're employed and if you've never run a business. Uh, so, you know, how do you do your bookkeeping? And so um, these people really, I think, are the ones that you want to ask. Questions. So we've dedicated the majority of this time to Q&A, so I want you to just think of what questions burning in your mind uh, that you really just, just need to know. But So I mentioned we have a lot of folks here from Kansas, so uh, this panel is heavily weighted for Kansas, and of course we had to, to bring in some Florida here to balance this off. So we have uh, Jennifer Herriter uh, with Oasis Family Medicine in Topeka, Kansas. Uh, Dr. Jaleesa Haynes, she's uh, Family First Health Center in Daytona Beach, Florida and Dr. Vance Lassie in Holton Direct Care from Holton, Kansas. Let's go ahead and invite that panel up here right now. Hi, I'll everybody. <laughs> okay, there you go. Good morning, everybody. I'm gonna talk about, uh, about this. So last year at, in Dallas, uh, I was asked to spontaneously be on this panel. <laughs> on this panel. And so uh, Lee set me down between uh, Carmela Mancini and Amy. <laughs> And uh, can we get that picture up? <laughs> okay, so this is th th this is how it went in Dallas. I got these high water pants on, and I've got my my shoulders folded in like this, so that I don't have an elbow. And these poor women crammed in. And then he puts this panel together this year with me. These two small, beautiful women. I'm like, what is up with you trying to embarrass me? And so with the, the, always putting the, you know, the beast with the beauty. So we embraced it this year. And uh, that, that is the thing. It's uh, just a little self-depreciating humor there. So, but, but there's, a, there's a more to it than that. And, and that's where Jen's going to tell you. Yeah, so we thought, you know, just go there. So we are going to talk a little bit about, um, you all know or you probably know, you're already part of the beast, right? And we all came out of the beast. And so now we're going to hopefully help you see the beauty in getting away from the beast and figuring out how to do this on your own. So um, I think we're going to start, start out with, with Delicia, yeah. Okay. Let me find the clicker. Okay, so I have slides because I don't want to forget to say stuff, and I probably will anyway, just ask me. So um, I put a whole bunch of ideas together, and I have to give Julie the, the credit for coming up with this title to like, wrap everything I wanted to talk about together. Um, but I think that for starters, regardless of what kind of practice you're creating, it, it, take a minute to think about what you really, really want. Like, why did you go to medical school? What did you think you were, it was gonna be like? Because you can, there's a lot of diversity in direct primary care, and there should be because we're all different. And so no two direct primary care practices are alike. Uh, so take a moment and think about like what you want. And, and a lot of this is gonna be things that I wish I had done because uh, I transitioned my practice and I was, I was actually fighting depression at the time which was not, the, like I needed to take a break, I needed to take a vacation, is what I needed to do, and that's not what I did. So I you know, just recommend that we all you know, take some time and take a break, listen to what really makes you happy, and then move forward. And I think we all need this, and this is not, um, it's not like if you're single to go out and get married or anything like that. I'm, I did this, um, I'm single, solo head of household, um, but it's really what I think is like we need to go into like the smarter recovery system because throughout medicine we're always told um, that it's, you know, it's always the patient first. You always have to put the patient first. Your needs come last. And that you know, it's, it's really hard to live a fulfilled life that way. Um, and to, to, if you're going to practice you know, hopefully you know, for a really long time, don't be a martyr the entire time. Um, and the first step to, 
that I think is to get really good at filling up your cup. So there are certain things that bring you joy, that make you come alive. There are certain things that just light you up and make sure you're doing those things on a daily basis. And then when you're serving other people, you serve them from your overflow, not from what's in your cup because that's for, that's for you. And I can always tell when I'm getting like irritated or something, it's usually because I'm giving something that I needed. Uh, so take a minute, fill your cup. When you're, when you're taking care of other people, you're serving them from your overflow. And then recognize that you are always teaching people how to treat you. So my name is Delicia. It's often mispronounced as Delicia, which makes sense because it's spelled that way. I will always correct you because I like my name. <laughs> so, you know, it's, and, it, and it's in every, every relationship, every patient encounter, and even, you know, the small things. Uh, you have to constantly teach people how to treat you, and especially in any kind of membership-based um, practice. And you decide what kind of relationships you want to have with your patients. So um, I like to empower people. I'm not your mama. I'm not your girlfriend. I'm not your wife. I'm your doctor. And be really clear about what your role is and what your role isn't. Because you can build a, a practice um, you know, with a lot of patients who are enabled, who need you for everything, or you can empower your patients, and, and, and that's what I like. Maybe if you, if you like enabled people, then do your thing. But um, you can empower your patients, and they're not you know, calling you all the time. They, they respect you, and it, it's just a better way, in my, in my opinion, to run a practice. And I want to say a, a note here as well, because you know, all of us who are running our direct primary care practices, we're all here for you. We're all available you know, for you. Um, but make sure that you're empowering yourself as well. I think that um, Doug did a great job talking about that learned helplessness. And um, sometimes we, we forget how empowered we are as physicians. Like you went to medical school, you know, you went to residency, completed both of those. You can do this if you want to. And that's the part that you have to figure out. No one else can tell you. The same way that your barber or stylist can go and set up a, practice, a shop, you can set up a practice. So um, we're all here for you, you know, but make sure that you've looked up some stuff you know, yourself. Um, there's, there's certain questions that you can actually figure out. And that's OK. And that's how we all did it. Like we made, we made mistakes, and we kind of figured it out. Um, so you know, we're all here for you. but. You know, we're gonna, I like, I empower people. So I, my, not all patients are for me because I'm going to push you. Um, you know, I'm gonna challenge you, that's my style. And all of us have a different style. Um, make sure that you set expectations. So anytime anything has ever come up in my practice, it's been a mismatch here between what someone was expecting and what they got. So you know, from the forefront, let people know, OK, if you write me, but how long is it going to take to get back to you? If you call, what can, what can the expectation be? And this is where um, you want to make sure that you're not like overselling and underdelivering, because there are certain things you can do when you have 100 patients that when you have 700, you can't do. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're, you're building yourself in such a way that you can meet the expectations and make sure the expectations are clear. Uh, from the hopefully from the beginning, but you know, I, you know, this is something that that came up, you know, in, in my practice that I was like, okay, I wasn't I wasn't clear on that, so let me clarify that. Um, set boundaries and enforce them. So, if you have a, you know, if someone isn't paying you, you know, you need to have a, a system for how you're going to deal with if they call and they want prescriptions or you know things of that nature. Um, and um, if someone is coming in more than you would like for them to come in or something. You, know, you just want to take some time to think about um, what your boundaries need to be. And especially once you set a boundary, like you have to, you have to keep it. You have to maintain it. Um, learn to say no. It's a complete sentence. Um, and people forget that sometimes in membership-based medicine, they feel like um, I have to do you know, everything that I would for this patient. and and like, like you're not their doctor anymore. And it's like, no, sometimes people have amazingly bad ideas for what they want to do, and it's your job to say no. Um, you know, you'll just, just say no. It's, 
and don't let people shit on you. You know, people always say, you should do this, you should do that. You guys are amazingly, you know, amazing, talented people. There's a lot of things that you could do, but that doesn't mean that you need to be doing them. So do the things that you want to do and don't let people shit on you and don't shit on other people and don't shit yourself. Um, give yourself a thousand second chances. You are going to make mistakes. That's part of the process. And press reset when you get to 999 because it's going to happen and you just have to learn to kind of keep it moving. Celebrate every single step and try not to get into comparison. It's hard not to, um, but just, you know, I know that I'm terrible at celebrating my little wins, but, you know, make sure that you, you do that. And get into action in anything. So I want all of you guys to give yourself a hand clap, like, right now, because it's Saturday, and you're in this room, <laughs> okay? So that already says a lot about you. Uh, because there's a, a lot of other places that you could be. It, it says a lot about you, it says a lot about your compassion, it says a lot about um, your, your care for your patients. And the very fact that you came here, regardless of what your next step is after this, um, is an action, it's an it's a incredible step. And really, you know, learn to say yes to yourself, no matter what. And if it's not a hell yeah, it's a no. Uh, so if there's something that you're kind of on the fence about, if you're not really excited about doing it, then don't do it. Um, and just, you know, just move on. This is your chance to build a practice that you love, a practice of your dreams. Don't recreate the nightmare. Um, so, you know, think about what you want and then kind of move, move toward that. And I think that's it for my slide deck. So I hope that was helpful. All right, that was inspiring. So now it's down to the nuts and bolts, right? So I'm Jen. I have a practice in Topeka, Kansas, which is the capital right in the middle of the whole country. I don't have any slides. I'm going to talk to you just briefly about some very specific things. So um, when we look at the objectives for this uh, particular session, one of the things that comes up very frequently as a question is, how do we figure out pricing and how do we set these levels and how do we negotiate all these prices? So I'm going to repeat some things that you've already heard, particularly from Lee yesterday. I will tell you my community is uh, very dominated by two hospital-owned systems. Most specialists, most labs, most outpatient clinics are all dominated by those hospitals. So um, our challenge was that really the best success comes from finding others that are doing independent practice. And we don't have very many of those in our community. So my first little nuts and bolts tip um, to get some beauty out of the beast is to find other people that already understand what it's like doing independent practice. Find these people that understand why cash works better for their practice, why they don't want to be hunting people down to pay the bills at 30, 60, 90 days, why they don't want to be talking to insurance companies. They understand if they're already doing an independent practice that cash is king. Then at that point, the difficulty is you say, well, I need to have a particular study done. What's the cost of that? And sometimes they really know, but they don't want to tell you, and you don't really know, and you don't want to guess. So my best uh, advice for that is ask them for a starting place. And again, echoing as Lee said yesterday, it's a starting place. You can always renegotiate it later. As a starting place, ask them for Medicare plus 10%, OK? In that way, then you at least sound like you know what you're talking about. I came prepared today. I would like to ask you for Medicare plus 10%. They already know what that cost is, and you didn't offend them by asking them to, you know, charge your patient $17 for something that really probably is worth a lot more than that, because you don't have any perspective for that. So that can be a valuable place to start for imaging. That can be a valuable place to start for specialist care, specialty tests that you don't have any other access to. For lab pricing, my clinic uses Atlas MD, and so does Vance's, and so we already have some built-in lab pricing through that. It is through Quest, and it's negotiated by Atlas for all of us. The nice thing about it is um, if you are part of that group and in the region where it works, that deal is done. If you're not, the nice thing about it is that it's a printed list that you can have access to, and you can go to your regional lab carrier and say, hey, this is what my colleagues around the country are getting. What can you do to match this? How close can you get? And if you can't, I'm going to the lab provider next door or down the street or even in the next town. Because of the disadvantage of where my community is 
um, from a care standpoint, and we have this limitation in independent practitioners. Um, we also are part of um, a bigger group that's helping negotiate prices on behalf of a larger group of patients, and that's the other thing that's beneficial. This morning, you know, we sat together as regional alliances, and that is also something that can give you some power to say, I don't just represent my little group of 500, 600, 1400 patients, but there's this broader scope. And so what can you do for us as a bigger group? And then my patients who might have to drive an hour to get an MRI for $300, don't blink an eye. I say you could have it here for, I'm guessing 2200, but we won't know till you get the bill and whether they'll write something, we don't know anything, or I know you can go there, pay cash today, it's 300 bucks, is that okay? out the door they go and they get it done. So those are some tips, I guess, I would say just in very basics for getting some of those prices negotiated for those extra ancillary services for your patients. The other thing about pricing that comes up all the time is, where do I set my fees? I think many of us that have been doing this for a while would argue we notoriously set our fees too low. So the first thing is to introspectively take a look at yourself and say, what am I worth? Okay, now we may have a value that is very different from what the market might say, but figure that out first. Have your little self-talk and say, what am I worth? What is my value? What do I offer? Then query your community. Query the people that are near you that are doing the same thing. People that are in a similar community to yours that are doing the same thing and say, hey, where have you set your prices and is it working? Have you had to adjust it in the last one to two years? Do you think it's too low? If you had to do it again, where would you put it? Set your price there, move on along. To figure out what you really need to do, you need to understand what you want to take home, what you have as overhead, how many patients you really want to serve, and put it in a big math equation. Figure out what your average take home per patient per month needs to be, and as long as that's covered in what you've set, you're golden. Okay, and we're happy to answer more questions about all of that, but that's my basic nuts and bolts. So it's an honor to be here, and especially on stage with these two. These two, you wouldn't know it, but they intimidate the heck out of me. They are beasts in the business world, and take their advice, and you will be ragingly successful. Um, so, so thanks for having uh, us here and everything. Uh, we're, we're trying to get through our, our part of this uh, with regard to just sitting here yapping at you as quick as possible because the question and answer for this a particular type of panel is by far the most valuable. So we'll crank through. We're trying to get through these, these kind of these bullet points with a few things that we know everybody wants to hear. And my special sort of speciality has become uh, negotiating and getting overhead down. And I've become kind of unintentionally notorious for it because I don't take crap from anybody and stuff. And, and uh, I'm, I've been friends with Doug Prego for way too long. And um, it shows it's not a good thing probably, but uh, what I'm talking to you about real quickly is keeping your overhead low um, to uh, kind of set your practice up. And the fact is, um, in the kind of, in the direct primary care model that we, most of us are doing, which is, you know, kind of starting up from the bottom on our own, um, it is not easy uh, to, to take home money and feed your family if you build a fancy, giant brick and mortar you know, you're going to go into debt. I mean, we all have to pay some kind of price, whether it's, uh, you know, selling your house and your fancy cars and downgrading and all that kind of stuff, or moonlighting all the time, or taking out a huge loan. There's, 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 there's a price to pay, but why make it huge? Make it as small as possible. The way to do that is low overhead practice. And uh, unless you're independently wealthy, that's what you'll probably find yourself being most successful at. So that's, that's what I did. And uh, I could talk for an hour on how I did it, but bottom line is keep your overhead low every chance you get, don't, don't settle for what everybody else is paying for anything. So um, you know, I'm not saying that I'm cheap, but I, you know, frugal response, whatever you want to call it, but a lot of used stuff. I got a lot of free stuff. People have read. I, uh, Julie, are you in? Where's Julie? There she is. Julie put together a sweet little book that we handed out in D.C. at the summit. And uh, I wrote a couple of articles in that. that is that available online or something? Perfect. So, so, so Julie, if, she, she, if you're not Facebook friends with Julie, you should be anyway. You already have a problem. Get become Facebook friends with Julie, and it's it's like a 20, 30 page type of deal. Uh huh? Yeah. Okay. Seventy. I was close. 
a uh, 70 page deal and I wrote, I wrote six or eight pages about basically how I did it, but I did all my own labor. I spent two or three months renovating my clinic space and, in, and I negotiated that with the owner of the building to cover my rent and utilities for, for two years. So, I, so no, no rent or utilities for two years and I saved, man, I don't know, 60, 80 grand just doing that. Everybody can learn how to lay tile. Watch a YouTube video. If you can like do surgery, you can lay tile, you know. Um, uh, find, find practices. One other thing I did to keep overhead low, find uh, practices that have gone out of business or big hospital systems, whatever, that have, they all have surplus, all of them. Talk to their, uh, the, the person that's in charge of their resources and materials management and, you know, butter them up, t tell them about how you're going to help people that don't have access to good health care, don't have insurance, that kind of stuff, which is true. And then say, but I can't provide, you know, great care to my patients for 40 bucks a month and be paying $2,000 for an exam table and $2,500 for an EKG machine, blah, blah, blah. And um, you'd be surprised what they'll just give you, not even discount. Like, they'll just say, yeah, take it. We're just going to end up throwing it away. And over time, you know, if, like, I don't know, the, the, ch my, the chairs that sit by my desk when I, the patients sit in whenever I talk to them, you know, I got them free. They're kind of beat up. But one of these days, I'll replace them with nice new ones whenever I have the money, you know. So um, I'm not saying you have to, your place should look like, you know, it's in a trailer house you know, with 1970s paneling on the wall. But you, you can do it right without spending a ton of money, and that's really huge. And if you don't do that, you'll find yourself struggling for a while. And then you're moonlighting all the time, and then you're, you're putting yourself into a burnout state, trying to not be burned out, which is ironic, and so you don't want to do that. So I will talk to anybody about that. I can talk about it forever. I wrote a bunch of stuff. It's in Julie's book thing that you can get off of her, download off of her Facebook, and we can, we can hook you up with all that stuff afterwards. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, stop these comments now. I'll, I'll go back into any details when you all have questions, but we think this is where the value is, is letting you guys step up to the microphone, because there will be questions, and we can do our best to answer them. So thanks a lot. So as you guys are thinking of your questions, uh, start making your way over to the microphones. I, what do you guys do for coverage when you're first starting off? I mean, how do you take a day off? Well, I mean, I, you, have, you have your cell phone, so your patients all have, has that, have access to you. So I'm, I'm texting patients the entire weekend here. But I also have, I have a doctor that's in, um, well, Dr. Herder and I actually share a call whenever we're both not <laughs> in Orlando. And usually we're not, so we just share. Uh, back, you know, for each other. Um, but there's a doctor, uh, Todd uh, Johnson, up in Lincoln, Nebraska, and he takes my phone calls and text messages, so we just share. Um, but I also took Phil's advice, and I, on my website, I offer virtually 24/7 coverage. There's going to be times when I'm in an airplane or whatever, and I'm, you know, but I do my best, and I'm almost always available for you. So, how about you guys? Yeah, I mean, that's the same, you know, your patients can access you pretty much wherever you are if you really need to detach, which is important and you should do it. Um, there are getting to be enough of us now that somebody certainly even in another location can cover your phone calls and your emails. Um, one of Vance's favorite things that I ask him to do is boo-boo duty. He's asked me forever never to call it that again. But, um, you know, so we really just make sure we have somebody that's available if we have a patient that really needs to be seen, needs sutures, needs, you know, and something that's in person that has to be done. We just make sure there's coverage for that. Um, our clinic went all together to the summit in D.C., and we actually just hired a nurse practitioner to do locums work for us. And um, we were able to easily get her covered with malpractice through our malpractice carrier. We paid her um, a relatively small amount to just be on call for us. And and she saw a few patients, and that worked out really well as well. And not a peep from our patients. They loved it. It was fine. And I'm, I'm in a town where I'm currently the only direct primary care practice there. And so, like they said, oftentimes you can take care of people um, just from your phone, just from your computer. And then um, when that's not available, like in April, I was in a car accident, had a traumatic brain injury. Um, and couldn't practice for about two weeks. So I actually, am, I work with the residency program and I had some of this, the uh, residents come and see my patients uh, while I wasn't able to, uh, to work. So there's a lot of different things that you can do to kind of um, to get coverage as you need it. And it, and it really comes to, again, with setting expectations with your, with your patients so they understand um, that, you know, what's available and what's not. Yeah, it's, it's it can be pretty lonely at times. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, as you guys are thinking of your questions, one thing also I would point out is that Dr. Lassie, you may not know, does full spectrum family medicine, in, inpatient. Yeah, actually I was just gonna think, I was just gonna and, say, we and, haven't really talked about our and actual And obstetrics. Practices. 
Yeah, uh, I, so we should all tell you real quick what we do. So I'm in, I'm in a rural town in northeast Kansas, a town of 4,500 people, something like that. And I do full spectrum uh, inpatient, outpatient, and OB. And I, there was a question earlier on the last, during Phil's talk, about getting hospital privileges, and I would love to talk about that at some point. Um, but so that, that's, that's what I do. Right now it's just myself and my nurse. As I, as I grow, I'm hoping to ultimately be able to hire another physician and, uh, you know, for you know, obvious reasons. So um, you guys talk about your practice? Okay. And I was gonna say, actually talk about like where you came from before you started. Oh man, okay, so I came from hell. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was a beast, man. Uh, I worked in the same town uh, in Holton. I worked for the hospital. I, it, the hospital's not hell. The system is hell. You guys know this. Um, I worked there for nine years, uh, employed, and uh, we, we worked hard. We, our weekend shifts, we have a busy ER. Uh, we would work uh, you know, every third, roughly, weekend, 62-hour shifts. We'd start at uh, uh, 5 p.m. on Friday. We'd end on Monday morning at 7 and you know, never go home that whole time. Just, it was brutal. Nine years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nine years. <laughs> so anyway. It's okay. It's over. It's like, it's it's that's over. right. It's, it's PTSD. Over. Sorry, yeah, I just had a flashback. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we go ahead and take some, some questions from the audience. Uh, you were first. Lady first. Oh, thank you. I think you were first. That's all right. Go oh, ahead. Okay. Um, so I have so many questions. I don't even know where to start. So I'm going to try to limit it so I don't monopolize all of the questions here. Everybody else has your questions too, though, so yeah. it's cool. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. I think I've seen all of you speak before at the other conferences. So um, I'm Terry Boland. I'm in Denver. I'm going to be opening up hopefully in January. And um, Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Great. So excited. And mm -hmm. I think all of us have some PTSD from mm -hmm. previous experiences and um, it, you know, just traumatizing. And it's just such a relief to have DPC now. And it's kind of a, a beacon of hope for a lot, of, a lot of us. So thank you so much for being here. Um, so office space, I, I'll try to limit it to three questions right now, and then I might come back. Um, so for office space, how did you get free rent and free utilities for two years? That's amazing, and uh, I would love to do simple, that as well. Real simple, one sentence answer. I, I renovated the space for, for the owner. So I did all the work myself. I put $3,300 worth of building materials into it. And I, I spent, while I was still working on the inside, every night, every weekend, I was in there laying tile, refinishing wood, painting, spackling a thousand square feet of sheetrock. And I put in, in that, that, that labor is really valuable. Yeah. And once I move out, once I get big enough and I need a bigger place, now he's got a really nice renovated office space that he can rent out and make money on. So that's where I put value into it for him. And I got two years, no rent. That's a sweet deal. Nice. And, um, so I think I could paint or do tiling. I don't think I can do sheetrock. Oh, I never try. Do I don't it. think I will. You can do surgery. You can spack. <laughs> you just smear the stuff on and sand it off. It's not hard. <laughs> Watch a YouTube video. I was thinking maybe you bartered services because that, I've heard, that. yeah, people trade health services, health care, mm -hmm. um, in exchange for rent. So I, I didn't know if that was of something. That. And I think we all do what some extent of that. I will say one thing. If you're gonna do a lot of bartering, you need to talk to your accountant about it yes. because you yeah. do have to say that there's a cash value of that so you don't get accused of tax fraud. Right. Or tax evasion, I mean, sorry. Okay. So yeah, if you do a lot of bartering where something's worth a lot of money, like I do all my graphic design work. I have a patient who's an award-winning graphic designer. She did all my design work in exchange for six months of her membership fee. Nice. And she just wrote me a receipt for you know, services rendered and I did the same. That way we both can say you know, cash value or whatever. So, but yeah, barter like crazy. Do Excellent. It. Yeah. I will. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so you're talking about, next question is phone and texting. Um, some people have completely cut off texting because they don't like it. They feel it's invasive. People are texting too late um, or inappropriate times or inappropriate topics. Um, what phone system did you set up? Did you get a separate phone? Some people just did a, um, a phone number. I think you were mentioning that yesterday. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about what you do? Sure. So, um, again, I mentioned we use Atlas MD as our EMR, and through that system, there's basically a dummy phone number that's assigned to each person in the clinic if you want it to be that way. So, as a provider, when I hand out my card, I say, hey, patients, you know, this is the urgent needs after hours text or call. 
Um, it doesn't work that way. People are like, um, you know, three in the morning, they expect, like any normal human, that if you don't want to get a text, you turn your phone off. And so I have to re-educate them and say, not a normal human can't turn my phone off because I'm going to be there for you if you have an emergency. So next time, you know, just shoot me an email at three in the morning when you realize you need a refill on your Lysinopril or whatever. Um, so it, it definitely opens you up to um, people's habits of being maybe disrespectful or just not thinking past the end of, you know, hit send. Um, but it can be very valuable as well. So one of the things that I hated when I had a pager was when that sound would happen, like I would get this twitch and I hated it or even the buzz, you know, it was like, oh no, it's happening again. And so what's really nice about a, a text is that, you know, if I'm in the middle of something with my kids or it's dinner time or I'm on the plane. Um, number one, you can set up an auto reply that says, hey, I'm on a plane and I will get back to you as soon as possible and if this is really urgent, please use the office phone number. Or it just gives you a little bit of wiggle room and a lot of times, um, you know, you can kind of get mentally prepared or you can think through it before the patient actually needs a reply back. It does avoid a lot of phone calls, although it sometimes is more work because there's a lot more back and forth. Sometimes it's like, hey, I'm just gonna call you and we'll just get this sorted out. And sometimes the reply is, call the office and get it taken care of that way. So there is definitely some training. Remember that your patients, as they come to you, they don't know inherently how to do this either. So, I mean, they've never been invited to text their provider. They've never been invited to email you directly. And so they don't really know the rules. We can't expect them to, you have to state it. You have to say, this is when you call. This is when you text. This is when you email me. And some of that you have to try it first and figure out what you want and then start saying the rules. So the way we communicate that to patients now is um, we send out Christmas letters. And in that Christmas letter, we call it Oasis at a Glance. And so it's like, here are our hours just to remind you. You know, here's how much notice we need for refills. And oh, by the way, here are the best ways to contact us. And then we reiterate, reiterate, reiterate. I'm glad to have it most of the time. Um, I don't, I do think it is something that our patients really value and sometimes the ones that, um, you know, you hand them the card and your phone number's on there and they're just in awe that they have this access, you don't even ever hear from them. It's just like their little safety net that they know that they could get to you if they need to. And then there are definitely those that you have to talk to over and over and say, stop. Your question is frequent online. You know, a lot of the people looking for this ask that question because it's so, it seems creepy, it's weird. I don't want them to have my cell phone or whatever. Get over that. They yeah. do not abuse you. If you well, don't do it, you're taking a huge, in my opinion, this yeah. is just my opinion. We all do things differently, but you're taking a huge value proposition hit if you don't offer that. And I guarantee you, I have patients who would not pay me my monthly fee if I was not available to them by a text. And yeah. it is, it, it rarely takes very long. And if you get the feeling it's going to be a long 10 minute back and forth texting thing, call them, get it over with. But yeah, I highly recommend the texting thing and do not worry. Like, they don't, they don't bother you. I've gotten like two phone calls at night in two years yeah. and text messages at night. If they're inappropriate, I either ignore them or like call the office tomorrow. Mm -hmm. it, you, it, it's all about what Delicia said. It's all about setting expectations. And I, you know, I have one patient, good friend of mine, really nice guy. I've taken care of this guy forever. And he knows, he knows I'm a night owl. Well, I've kind of changed since I'm in DPC. I can actually have normal schedules now and stuff. So I actually was in bed at 1130, which is crazy, but I was in bed at 1130 <laughs> and this guy sends me a text message. No, yeah, text message at like 1145 for, some drug refill. No, 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 no. He called me because he woke me up. I'm like, dude, are you serious? It's not like, I, well, I figured you'd be up. <laughs> he has never called me again. <laughs> yeah. no, it's, but, you know, yeah. it's just set expectations. It's not yeah. a big deal. I recommend that you text. I'm going to ask you to hold yeah. for one second sure. I'm sorry. Um, while I get your question over. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank you guys for being here for us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee Gross, for all your help uh, with this transition. I just want to share with you that Monday I'm going to sign the letter to the insurance to say that I'm 90 days and I'm not going to be anymore with them. <laughs> so celebrate that, man! Yeah. Celebrate that. Thank you. Remember that day. It's like yeah. your birthday. Yes, yeah. I know, I know. I will remember it well. So the first question is how to deal with the self-pay patient because I practice holistic medicine and I have a bunch of self-pay patients. So how to deal with those guys? Not just to encourage them to be uh, in the DPC. To encourage your, your self-pay patients to go DPC? Yeah. You say, okay, patient, you give me the money, I give you the care, end of transaction. <laughs> like, yeah. They're the low-hanging fruit. Yeah. The self-pay patients, in my experience, have been the low-hanging fruit. What, yes, those absolutely. Are the, those are the easiest. Uh -huh. um, they already speak cash. Yeah. 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 
they're going to see the value faster than someone who um, is insured and feels like they're overpaying for insurance and, and might be seeing this as an add-on. Yeah. So the, the uh -huh. people who are paying already cash are yeah. the people who are going to be running to you. Oh, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. and the, okay. But, uh, the other question is how to deal with vacation because I, I like vacation and I normally take two vacations a year. So the coverage with some, another physician or how to, how, mm -hmm. to do, how to deal with that? Because I normally take at least 10 days, 10, 14 days. So you'll just need to find some coverage, either a colleague that lives near you, somebody that's willing to cover, and they don't have to be DPC, mm -hmm. but it is definitely much easier to find somebody who's already like-minded because of what you're gonna ask them to do, or hire somebody that's a locums that um, will do that. Um, I know in our area, there's already developing a small network of uh -huh. um, even nurse practitioners or physicians that are doing locums work and they're willing to cover DPC practices. So, I mean, it may be somebody you have to pay. If you can find a colleague, then it's somebody you can just trade services with. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I was just gonna say, um, just, you know, also let your patients know. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I, prior to my accident, I was rowing for two hours a day. I'm on the river. I'm not going to answer any phone calls because I'm on the water. Um, one of my patients gave me a, like, waterproof, like, case for my phone. And I was like, well, thank you. Now I can take pictures. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yes. And when I'm not rowing with both of my hands. Um, so I think, you know, I don't, I don't want to overstay say the, the set expectations part, but I think it, it really does, um, it, it's really, really important. And people, I think, need to see their doctors living the lifestyle they recommend. Because for a long time, I was telling other people that you need to sleep eight hours, and you need to exercise, and you need to do this, and I wasn't doing any of that. Uh, and so now, you know, like, I've got patients who are out there rowing with me, well, not with, I'm not out there right now, but um, who are out there rowing because I sent an email like, hey, this is what I'm doing. There's a learn to row class. Um, when I go on vacation, I let them know, I'm, you know, I'm going on vacation. You know, sometimes I'll have residents who will cover for me. Um, and sometimes I, I've also made arrangements with the urgent care that they can go there and they have a, a discounted rate. And like, I can take care of you if I'm in the U.S. I can take care of you by my phone really easily. And if you absolutely need to be seen, then you can go to this urgent care that we've got some you know, special rates with. I'm going to ask e each one of you to give me just a very brief, as, as brief as you can, because when I started off uh, about marketing, your marketing mm -hmm. and what's worked for you, and I want each of you to give me what you think is your probably one best pearl for how you market your practice because you know we spent thousands and thousands and thousands or I shouldn't say we spent we wasted thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in marketing uh, we've done television we've done radio we've done print ads we've done direct mailers we we had billboards we even had a bus wrapped that was driving up and down the street oh and actually the bus wrap probably got us the most calls because the bus kept cutting people off and they said your damn bus cut me off <laughs> um, <laughs> But, Perfect. That's awesome. and then when people come into the practice, like, this is amazing, you should tell people about this. Like, yeah. yeah. What, what, it, what is one thing for each of you that you feel has been your best marketing success? Um, so I'm naturally an introvert, so I would say empowering my extroverted patients to go and spread the word, uh, because I'm not ever going to be the loudest voice in the room unless I have a microphone. And so, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a lot of that, just so word of mouth. Word of mouth, but really, like some people don't know that you want them to go and spread the news until you tell them, like, no, please go and, and you know, tell it. Here, here's some cards, hand them out to people. Everyone knows someone who needs this. Um, so I think for me, that was, that was the biggest one. Uh, 90, 90, 98% word of mouth. And the way, but it's word of mouth is not really the advertising. The advertising is excellent patient care. Yes. You take great care of people, the kind of stuff they are not used to. And they, trust me, they will tell their friends and their family members. And, and, and identify your champions. You're gonna have a handful of patients who are just out of their mind with happiness because of their previously lousy interactions with physicians and the system. And man, give them a t-shirt. I, I, I keep a box of t-shirts, every size. With uh, It's got my logo on the front and my slogan and on the back, it says uh, health insurance is not health care. And I, I, my champions, man, when they're in the office, hey, you need a new t-shirt? They wear that sucker all around town, brag about their doctor, they, and they post stuff on Facebook. I don't have to do anything but take care of people, which is what I love doing anyway. 99%, the other 1% is Facebook. I've, I've gotten some benefit out of Facebook. I threw a little bit of business at our local paper just for political reasons, and uh, the, the newspaper ads were worthless, but anyway. 
Um, what we've done different from that, because I would definitely echo what they say, but we also spent quite a bit of time, even before we opened, um, volunteering to be a guest speaker for civic organizations, the mm -hmm. Rotary Club, the Lions Club. And I think that you hear this over and over, but then what I hear back as feedback over and over is nothing came of it. That is because this is an investment that has to mature. Somebody will come into your practice and you say, well, how'd you hear about us? Well, 18 months ago, I was at a Lions Club meeting, or mm -hmm. my friend of a friend of a friend was at the Lions Club meeting, and they mentioned something, and I just thought about it. Remember your early adopters still. You're in on this on the front edge of it, and it's very hard to think differently. So you're planting seeds all over, and don't ever discount that. We've done lots of um, you know, free speaking engagements, and then as far as money spent, the only things we've done are some sponsorships. Um, we get a lot of mammograms for our uninsured patients through a um, nonprofit, so we've sponsored their 5K race, things like that, where we get our logo out there. But really, it's just this investment of spreading the word. Thank you. Last question for now. Um, Dr. Haynes, I think you got, uh, on your logo, it said that you do aesthetics as well. Mm -hmm. Um, how did you get into aesthetics? How did you integrate that? I'd like to do a little bit on the side. Do you do Botox, fillers, lasers? What was your training and how did you integrate that? Thank you. So, um, so I guess a little background. So I started a, a clinic right out of residency. I started my own practice. It was fee for service. Um, prior to medicine, I was an interior designer. So how things look actually really matters to me. Um, and so I was naturally drawn to aesthetics from day one then I was doing aesthetics. And there's a lot of different training programs that are out there, and I, you can talk to me afterwards, and I'll um, let you know which ones are good. Um, so it, it was something that I was naturally interested in. There's a lot of, I think some people are drawn to aesthetics just because you can make some money at it. I don't think that's a good enough reason by itself. Like, I, I enjoy doing it, and I'm really good at it, and that's, you know, why I do it. Um, I've incorporated it into my practice. No, it's not included in the membership fee, which people do ask, which is, because does this include my Botox? Like, no, come on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's just, you know, it's, it's something fun that I enjoy doing that I do um, as well. We have a question over here. Hi, I'm uh, Claire Shervanik from New Mexico. I think I'm the only one here from New Mexico and probably blazing a trail Good. in that Yay. state period. But, um, I just want to put one more plug in for Julie's book. Um, I downloaded that a few months ago and it's been my Bible. Uh, it's very dog-eared, so I uh, really appreciate it. Um, I have a specific question about group purchasing organizations and how those work. I know that Atlas is just one of them. Are they regional? Are they national? Do you have to have some specific association to be involved in them? Are you part of any TPOs besides that? Uh, not really. I, I, no. Uh, so Atlas has one that's sort of built in, just like, like their lab thing that I use, and that gets us a little bit of a discount at uh, McKesson and at uh, uh, Anamed's pharmacy we use. Uh, not huge, but there's a discount there. Our best GPO has been, uh, we have a regional you know, alliance, the Midwest, we call it the Midwest Direct Primary Care Alliance. It's, what, we have 28 somewhere in there, doctors from kind of the, all, like within two hours of Kansas City. And as a group, we represent now well over 10,000 patients. And so now we have this sort of bulk uh, purchasing power, I guess I would call it, and we use that to negotiate lower everything. And so uh, it, you name it. And, and then the another great example is that the, the uh, Facebook, the DPC Docs Facebook group, um, there's a thousand, over 1,000 people on there now. Not all of them are DPC doctors. A lot of them are people who are doctors who want to go into DPC or maybe the residents or whatever. But uh, just recently, I spent some time, I think Josh talked about this when he was making fun of me yesterday morning. And, um, but yeah, I just, I, I needed an EKG machine anyway. So I went online and um, found a company that sold the one that I wanted. And uh, I got on DPC docs, like, hey, anybody else need one? And like 20 people like, yeah, I need one. And I go, well, if I can get a good deal, are you in? And they're like, yeah, you get a good enough deal, I'm in. And so I figured we could sell at least 20 of them. So I go to this guy, hey, I need, I need 20 EKG machines, what do you do? And then he gave me a price, and then I went to this competitor and back and forth until I got over $1,000 off on that sucker. I got it down to like, from 2,500, we got them for 14.95. No, don't hold your applause, wait, wait, wait. But then, <laughs> oh, they, no, this, more. This, this, this retail guy was like, he calls me, and we're talking, and he goes, well, if I give you a lower price, our, are you just gonna call the other guy again and tell him what it was? I'm like, of course yeah. I am. Yeah. And now here's where it really gets, He's, he goes, 
and this, is, this demonstrates the problem with the lack of price transparency in the system. He goes, I've been in medical retail sales for 10 years and no one has ever done this to me. <laughs> you walk into any big box store and you'll see like a 12 foot sign on the wall in front of your face, like neon, that's like, we match our competitors' prices, 10%, whatever, right? Like they are all, this guy's in the retail industry and in 10 years, no one's ever expected him to match or compete with his, they, people just write a check, okay, 2,500 for EKG, here you go. And because it all gets, it all trickles down and the patient gets screwed. We are the patient's advocate. Our job is to protect them. And we're protecting our business as well, because guess what? If I pay 2,400 for an EKG machine, I can't charge an average of 40 for my monthly membership. Everything goes up, my value proposition, proposition goes down, and I can't feed my, my kids and my Diet Mountain Dew habit. So we've got a problem, <laughs> we've got to get this price. So anyways, these, these guys go at each other, and they get the price down. And then, this is where, you can clap after this, because this is awesome. I, I get a phone call from the manufacturer. The, the, the company I wanted to buy these from is an American company, vet-owned company, American these, these uh, EKG units are made in America. I was like, this is the one I want. And uh, the manufacturer representative calls me. And what she asked me in a nutshell is, hey, are you the doctor that's putting the squeeze on my two uh, distributors? <laughs> you know? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it was a nice conversation. And, and she goes, well, what's that about? And I explained DPC and why we're doing this. And she goes, okay, I get that. You know, I want to help with patients too. So I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to lower the, the wholesale price of our unit to the, to the resellers because I want them to be able to make a profit. So just with me making a handful of phone calls and a bunch of text messages or, or I mean emails to these guys, we ultimately drove down the price from the top of the manufacturer all the way down to the patient with a group of people in a, our own non-official GPO. And so we have this power to affect the entire system. I mean, now... Anybody who knows any of us can get 48% or whatever it is off of an EKG machine. With, we have that power. So you don't necessarily have to join a GPO. Do it yourself. It's a little work, but think of how much money you save in the long run. So, um, and that's how the phrase Vansonomics was coined. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 Yes. <laughs> Question. You are truly earth shakers and groundbreakers, so <laughs> I'm in awe of all of you. Um, my question is about referrals. I'm in Massachusetts, which has a big, a huge HMO market, and so when I don't see those patients as their PCP anymore and I need to send them to a, a specialist, they'll have another PCP who is supposed to do that referral. Um, how have you, you have that issue? Have you, have you worked around it? I, I live in a small community. I could probably approach a lot of the specialists directly, but I can't finagle the insurance paper trail. Um, that's my question. Delicia, do you have HMO yes. people? And yeah. Lee, I don't think Jen and I have uh, What I know I other people do is have a collegial relationship with the HMO of record, you know, the provider of record through the HMO, mm -hmm. send a letter, ask for the referral, and a lot of times it works. I mean, it's less work for them. You say, hey, I've diagnosed this, and I'm going to save you the trouble yeah. of having to see exactly. this patient just to get them in. The well, they have to establish a relationship with that HMO doctor. They can't just rubber stamp what you've done without establishing that relationship. But, yeah. you know, with the HMO penetration that you have up in New England, it's really tough. Just ask Jeff Gold. I mean, that's a huge issue for him. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I mean, we have, you know, and unfortunately, you find yourself in a situation where you've got the good doc and then the insurance doc. Yeah. Um, it's an unfortunate situation, but sometimes you have to deal with that. And sometimes you can go directly to the HMO. So there's an HMO in our, in our area that I am technically, you know, not in contract with anymore, but they still acknowledge my signature for labs, for referrals, for things of that nature. And I would just encourage one thing. Even if you think you can't get it done, try it. Yeah, uh, because, you know, I had a patient that, that had a Medicaid HMO, and I had no idea they had a Medicaid HMO. I'm not a Medicaid provider. We needed to get a CT scan for the patient, and so we just called the HMO, and we went through their prior authorization procedure and they approved it, even though we weren't in network. So as long as we were willing to follow and jump through the hoops and give them the documentation they needed, they still did it and we, mm -hmm. and we avoided having to refer the patient out. We have just a few more minutes if anybody. Yeah, uh, Jennifer, you talked about uh, making some, uh, doing some talks to local organizations mm -hmm. as a way to get the word out. Uh, what were some of the uh, things you talked about uh, uh, just general, um, I mean, I've, he I've heard folks going out and taking blood pressure, sure. doing that sort of thing, mm -hmm. but if you had any sort of go-to topics that you like to talk about, I'd be interested sure. in what my those might be. So it can vary a lot. You could do like a little mini health clinic. You can ask the organization, do you have a topic that you're interested in? You know, if it's 
seasonal, if it's something that's going around right now, if it's a group of women, do you talk about women's health or men's health or whatever that is? But in truth, with a lot of the civic organizations, we just talked about our business. We actually just pre presented this and said, this is what we've brought to the community and this is the change that we anticipate it will make and they allowed us that luxury of just discussing our business. So um, I think, you know, um, if you've ever been in a civic organization, and particularly if you've been the person in charge of filling up the speaker schedule, usually you're falling on your knees in gratefulness and someone volunteers to fill up that schedule. So um, then you just ask them, is there a topic you'd like me to address? And if not, it's going to be just shameless self-promotion the whole time. So, you know, and, and it really, this is what I see every time. And you guys have probably been through this if you've talked to anybody else that doesn't understand DPC. You say, hey, I'm going to do this new thing. And they're like, Pfft that will not work. I mean, you see it on their face. They're like, they give you the frown and they're like, no. And you start talking about it more and then they get kind of mm -hmm. contemplative. Mm -hmm. And then you get to the point where you've laid the whole thing out and they're like, I'm gonna tell everybody I know, this is the most amazing thing I've ever heard of. And that's the way it goes in groups too. You sure. see it as a group, they're frowny and then they're thinking the, yeah. and then they're filled with joy. You can just see yeah. that when, when they get it, you can just, you, that you, little you, line you goes on. Yeah. And the first time it happened, I thought, I'm losing them, I'm losing them. <laughs> and then you just gotta get to the end and you've got them. One more quick thing. Um, I think I'm about to, about to ask a really stupid question. Right. So perfect. Yeah. Bring it on. <laughs> perfect. Yeah. Uh, I, my wife is going to be the uh, practitioner, and I'm going to be the staff. Um, I've made uh, talks in front of people before like crazy. It doesn't bother me at all. My wife probably would dread it. Can you imagine any way that I can go up and make that speech for her? Absolutely. For the practice? Absolutely. Um, uh, but I mean, uh, at some point in time, obviously, uh, patients going to want to see the doctor. They're buying the doctor. Right. Yeah. You, right. right. You know. Exactly. They're buying the doctor. So, right. but right. I but mean, think about a large group that's an independent practice. It's not usually one of the providers that comes to speak to another group about services. Okay. It's usually right. the practice manager that comes and makes the first contact. In my experience, anyway. So, okay. I don't think there's any problem with that. And if she can come along and be maybe part of a Q and A, that might be more comfortable. Right. So you present the nuts and bolts, and then she's part of the Q&A. Not the worst thing you ever heard. No, no, no. And I can also no. tell you that about five, I, I absolutely despise public speaking. It makes me very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and about four weeks ago, I gave a talk to 2,000 people in Las Vegas. So you can't overcome that. The, the civic organization thing uh, is also a great way to advertise DPC, even though that's not why you're called there. So I, I was called, I did the, uh, um, a, a presentation for our local Lions Club about a week, two weeks ago, and they wanted me to come talk about diabetes. And um, because at the Lions Club meetings, they eat like these huge piles of potatoes and all this kind of stuff, and they all are apparently hyperglycemic. <laughs> so I came and talked to them about diabetes. Before you know it, they were asking, what do I do? How does it work? And I made this huge DSPC presentation. They were eating it up. And that wasn't why I went there. So I, it, it turned into a sales thing, even though that's not what I was asked to come do. So that's cool, too. These are going to be the last two questions right here. You've been waiting for just a little bit. So. Hey, afterwards, though, <laughs> talk to us. We'll ask, uh, we'll talk, stick around and answer questions anytime. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I'm sort of in the same boat as the gentleman on that side. I, my husband's the doctor. I'm the office manager. Um, and so I'm usually the one that pitches to people. And we've just started in the last month. But I have a couple of questions. First one being, does anyone have any type of marketing sample materials that we could take a look at? We're in West Virginia. There's only one other doctor, it's Dr. Wood, that's in the northern part of the state. There's no one else in our state doing this. We're the first to start as we just passed it. Um, so we're looking for some like sample brochures, that kind of I've thing. I've got brochures and stuff back in the corner. Afterwards, catch me. I'll give you some. Great. Um, so we're looking for that. Also, we're in the position, my husband's been practicing, um, he was a family practice physician, he's gone, he went into training for um, varicose veins, doing laser surgery for varicose veins. He's been doing that for a few years. It has gone down, down, down to the point where we've had to look at him going back into family practice, which is what led us to this. Um, so we've had, we've struggled financially, which I'm, I've talked to some other people here, we're not the only ones in that boat, which has made us look at this. So we're kind of starting over. Is there any, uh, we need some working capital. Is there any, do you have any suggestions as to where to get small working capital loans at good rates for something like this? Yeah, just get, you talk to the Small Business Administration in your area. 
And most areas have people that help with that. And then most local the community for banks long. also, they usually give you enough. Local bank, is that what you said? Yeah, enough yeah. money to hang yourself with, unfortunately. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, we're, we're having a little bit more trouble with that. Yeah. Um, you can also uh, sell stuff. Because of the business model? Are I they th I think unfamiliar? So. I think so. They yes. don't know how to estimate what Yeah, what maybe you can to. work with somebody to help you write your business plan a little bit better. Yes. Do you have <coughs> local um, community college or even university that yes. somebody that has a business center? Yeah, business center. A lot yeah. of times they work with people who are developing small business. They can get you a great business plan. They can get you connected with small business friendly you know, all kinds of people in your community as well. And okay. that's usually free. Yeah. All right. There's, an, orga there's an organization called SCORE, which I think yes. is nationwide. Yes. I, and I forget, what does it stand for? The Don't Society know. of Retired. Yes. Retired, so, yeah, 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 yeah. Retired people who did things that we didn't do. Oh, uh, business people. Business people mm -hmm. who, you know, are very, very helpful. So there's a lot of um, community resources that we forget about. So really tap into those community resources. You don't need to spend a ton of money. You don't have to go into debt. Yeah. I, I can tell you guys, I put, to st start my practice, including the materials to do the renovation work and what I didn't get free or super duper cheap or used or go to auctions for, I'm all in on my practice for $20,000. That's everything. Right. No, That's, we, we don't feel like we need a lot to add. Yeah, $20,000, sell a car. I mean, you know, open a practice. Question, question for you, too. The EKG machines, is it possible to check Yeah, talk to me afterwards. Fourteen fourteen ninety five. dollars I'll do that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> How about a round of applause for our panel here? Oh, wait, wait. She did one more. You promised her. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm you sorry. get. Yes. Yeah. I didn't see us. Um, just one line about myself. I'm actually a neurologist who's infiltrated this meeting. Ooh. Nice. Um, so my thought is I'm currently working, um, employed uh, part-time. And so I'm thinking of just maybe starting out one or two days a week and um, maybe sharing office space with somebody. But of course, there's no direct neurology um, out there where I am, so there's nobody else in the same boat. And so I'm considering um, sharing a space with somebody who is a traditional practitioner. So do you have any uh, words about kind of that mix of sharing space with somebody who is taking insurance? Is that Plus, negative. I notice that psychiatrists do it all the time. You go into a mixed practice, and there'll be some that are space is a space. I don't. I don't think it matters. I rent my space from a, a printing company. So, like on the other side of the wall from my office, there's like two giant copy machines and folding machines and making noise sometimes and stuff. And you find a space. I don't think payment. As long as you have a separate business entity, it doesn't matter where you are. I mean. People will come if the service is right and the value proposition is correct. I think the only key here is who answers your phone. Because if it's the insurance model that answers your phone, you're going to have a difficult time getting those questions answered appropriately. So that would be the only hurdle I would make sure you have, you know, worked out, I guess, is how patients access you.